Hey, good morning, Calvary. Thanks for being with us for today's service. If you've got a Bible, would you open it up to Psalm 96? Uh, today we're coming to the end of a series here in August where we've been talking about prayer and looking at the Psalms for different models of prayer and praising God. Uh, next week we're going into a little book in the early part of your Old Testament called Ruth. It's only a handful of chapters long, but it's got a big message about uh, life's unexpected journey and how God may show up in ways that we don't see coming. And it talks about the highs and the lows of life. And I'm looking forward to going into Ruth next week. So uh, <clears throat> human beings are kind of wired for praise. Um, I would define praise as a good response to what we see that's good. Uh, fall sports teams are kicking off, and parents are going to be there cheering on their kids, and they're going to cheer every caught pass, every defended goal, every bump set spike. And sometimes with their kids, they're going to be praising kids who just hung on and finished well when their team got pounded because our eyes are always open to see what's good, and the natural impulse is to respond to that, to have a heart reply when we see greatness, when we see glory, power, goodness, uh, character, you name it. Um, it happens with people, it happens with the environment. Uh, we all hate to see summer go, but when autumn comes and the maples and the birches start to turn red and orange and yellow, uh, we respond. We, even though we know winter's coming, there's a response to this change of beauty that's God ordained. Um, even with simple things like meals. A month ago, uh, Karen and I hosted my sisters who were up visiting for a week, and we had sweet corn one night. And from the conversation around the table, you would think that we had never tasted sweet corn before. You would think this was the first time we had ever been in to a wonderful era of sweet corn. Well, you know, we've eaten sweet corn all our lives, but it was so good, you couldn't not make noises. You couldn't not comment about it and talk about it. <clears throat> well, the question for us today is um, what part does praise have in your prayer life and how do you approach praise when you come to church on a Sunday morning? Um, are you and I giving a good response to the goodness, the greatness, the power, the character of God? <clears throat> and that needs to happen in our personal prayer life during the week because honestly, like if I'm a stranger to God all week long, why would I come to church on Sunday morning necessarily expecting that church is going to do a miracle for me because I came in the building? Uh, the question is, during the week, am I responding to the goodness of God? And then when I come to church and I participate in worship on Sunday morning, am I ready to praise God because during the week I've developed this habit of responding to Him? So that's where we're at in Psalm 96 today. And uh, it's a psalm about praise. 96. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Each day proclaim the good news that He saves. Publish His glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things He does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of the other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns, the world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge the peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with his truth. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, this day we want to come to your word to find the right words to bring back to you. Uh, you created us for a relationship with you. 
You made us in your image so that we can know you. But Lord, um, we can have very distorted views of who you are and what you're doing. We have uh, temptations to sin and doubts that we face and wounds that we carry. And Lord, today uh, we just need for your word to remind us of your goodness and your greatness and how we can respond and reply to that and put our trust in it in spite of the things going on in life. So Lord, today would you uh, speak to us by your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so today um, is kind of one urgent message, and that is to keep praise a priority in your prayer life, whether you at home, uh, whether it's you in a car, uh, commuting to work, or whether it is you here in church on a Sunday morning, keep praising God a priority. Um, <clears throat> there are times when the needs of our own life and loved ones will press us to God in prayer. There are times when guilt and shame will push us to God in confession of sin. Uh, there are times when uh, God's surprises and blessings will just motivate us to spontaneous gratitude. Whatever the situation is, whatever your needs or blessings are uh, currently, will praise, will responding to the goodness of God be a priority for you in your personal prayer life, in your private life, and in your public worship? Uh, Psalm 96 looks up to the Lord in worship, it looks out to the world with good news, and it looks forward to the future with trust. And so I want to talk about these three things uh, this morning. First, <clears throat> um, praise and worship is giving a good response to the goodness and greatness of God. So <clears throat> praise and worship is not first and foremost about whether I like to sing. Uh, it's not first and foremost about my tradition or my background. It's not first and foremost about the music that I like or who's on the worship team or what's on the radio. Uh, praise begins with my response to what I believe about God. And if I believe that God is good and powerful and mighty and faithful and holy, there is going to be a response that comes out of me in the same way that if I think God is distant uh, uncaring, aloof, um, th that's going to create a very different response, obviously. So what does the Bible tell us about us? What does Psalm 96 have to say? Well, for one, he's the creator of the universe. Um, he is beyond our comprehension. His magnitude, his power, his knowledge, his eternity, these are all things that exceed the capacity of, of a human mind to take in. We can't get our arms around him. We can't figure him out. We certainly can't manage or control him. Uh, he designed gravity. He designed the elements. He's the one who said, let there be light. He's the one who is behind the laws of physics and mathematics and uh, DNA and the human genome. He is the one who gives life and breath to everything that lives and breathes. He's the one who shaped the mountains and he's the one who shaped you in your mother's womb. So that's where we start is realizing that the glory and power and majesty and holiness of God is beyond my human comprehension. <clears throat> he's the God who called a nation of slaves to be his people and the armies of Pharaoh and the depths of the Red Sea could not hold him back. He is a God who when his people rebelled against him, he sent them into the desert, and yet he fed them and led them every step of the way to bring them home. He's the God who led his people in a land with enemies too numerous, too powerful for them to conquer, and yet he gave them the land because he had promised to, in spite of their weaknesses and failures. So <clears throat> the big question um, for us, when we think of praise, is not what kind of music you like, but what do you think and believe about God? Do you believe that He is greater than anything you can begin to comprehend? That He is not comparable to any force, power, person on earth? Because ancient people um, tended to create gods, idols, in the image of, of really of what they 
um, thought the gods would be like, their personalities. So uh, the ancient people believed in hundreds of gods. Uh, they were generally no more moral or better than human beings are. And they all had limited spheres of, of responsibility. And therefore, the whole world was seen as being in chaos and competition and conflict because the gods are in chaos and competition and conflict. Well, modern people today don't tend to worship Baal or Ra or Asherah, but we do worship man-made things. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, greed is idolatry because it's putting your faith and hope and trust in money and in things. And there are all kinds of things and people that we idolize. People particularly because people are the only thing in the universe made in the image of God. Uh, so we can idolize, we can put our faith and reliance on, we can believe that what's really in charge is, you fill in the blank, the economy, uh, technology, military power, uh, medical power, governmental power, famous personalities, <coughs> um, cultures of entertainment and sport and economy, political parties, um, movements, ideologies. We can look at all these things as being kind of what's really in charge, what's really calling the shots. And the Bible just calls us back and says, hey, time out, folks. <coughs> there is one creator who spoke the universe into existence and he is perfect in holiness he is absolute in power he is perfect in knowledge and he is the one whom we worship because he made us we did not make him so verse 10 says this tell the nations that the lord reigns when god invites us to worship and praise him he is inviting us to know Him and to draw close to Him. He is inviting us to humble ourselves before Him because God resists the proud but draws close to the humble. Uh, he is inviting us to celebrate Him and to enjoy Him because God did make us for a relationship. Uh, this month, September, <coughs> in the city of Walker Roys means ethnic fest and there's parades and a lot of music and crowds and great food and, and people are gonna, who participate are going to be praising all kinds of things through the day. They're going to praise the music. They're going to clap along and tap their feet and sway to the music and applaud the musicians. They're going to comment on the great food. Um, they're going to reply to people who they interact with if they're going through the day with family or friends, especially if they haven't seen somebody they care about in a long time. There may be hugs or, how have you been? Or, oh, I've missed you. Because we're made to respond to the good and beautiful things that we see. Well, folks, God is inviting us to the party which He began, which He will conclude, and which He is the center of attention in because He is the ultimate good, the ultimate power, the ultimate personality in all the universe. A second direction Psalm 96 goes is it looks out to the entire world with a message of good news. Our God saves. Not only did He make the universe, but He is working out a rescue plan for the nations of the world. So he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of Israel, but he is the God of all nations. He is the God of the universe. He is the creator of all people. When the Lord God in Genesis called Abraham to trust him and follow him and told him that he would be a father of nations, he said that he was doing it in order not only to bless Abraham and his children, but through them to bring a blessing to the world. And throughout the Old Testament, we see hints and glimmers and spotlights on this, although obviously most of the Old Testament, the focus remains largely on Israel. But that seed is germinating and growing over time. And here in 96, we see the psalm saying, um, Proclaim each day the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things that he does. <coughs> Uh, further down in verse 7, O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize the Lord as glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory He deserves. Bring your offerings and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in all His holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before Him. Again, tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. 
<coughs> when Jesus Christ arrived in fulfillment of Old Testament promises, that uh, seed out of Genesis 12 bloomed and flowered and continues to multiply and grow throughout the earth to this day. John the Baptist is the one who said of Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he is not just Israel's Savior. He is not just for the sons and daughters of Abraham according to the flesh, but for all who trust in him. Jesus told Nicodemus that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever trusts in him would not die but would have everlasting life. Uh, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks to his followers and said, you're going to go into all the world, you're going to announce the kingdom, you're going to make disciples, you're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because what he is doing is done with the whole world in view. The Apostle Paul said in Athens that God has been kind and generous and gracious to all nations. And even though they have worshipped idols, God is not far away from them, but he is close and calling to them and bringing them to the good news of Jesus Christ so that they can respond to it in faith. Uh, John, the author of Revelation, uh, sees the end of God's story when gathered before the throne of Christ in heaven is an uncountable sea of humanity from every tribe, from every nation, every language group. They are all worshiping Christ and they have all brought with them their God-given identity, their God-given background that is who they are as a people, a people who've been united around the Savior, Jesus Christ. So Psalm 96 has a loving response to God and worship and praise, but then it has a message for the nations. And folks, when we um, are in love with God and we know that God loves us, there is a desire to share that with other people in the same way that when you see a beautiful sunset, you comment on it to the people around you. Or if you go to Music Fest and see an incredible music group, you're going to tell others about it because that's the way praise works. We're not content to praise alone ourselves, but we are eager for other people to see and know and taste and experience what we have for ourselves. <coughs> Finally, Psalm 96 looks to the future. Uh, it looks to the time <coughs> when all the earth, all of nature is responding in glory to God. <coughs> it says... Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise before the Lord, for He is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the earth with justice and the nations with His truth. Um, in Psalm 96 and in the Old Testament, there is a holy anticipation of the justice of God, of God bringing His power, His kingdom, His glory, His goodness, and His evaluation to the earth over all people. Uh, the whole world wants justice, but you can't have justice without judgment, without an evaluation of right and wrong and consequences. And you can't have judgment without a judge. And the Bible says that Jesus, our Savior, all judgment has been entrusted to him. It is to him we will answer. He is the one who offers us redemption and forgiveness of sins. And he is the one before every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, the other night I was uh, looking at a news story, a war story out of Ukraine. There was an older Ukrainian man, great big guy, no shirt, uh, standing in front of a pile of rubble, cinder block, twisted metal that had been his home. And I looked at that photo for a long time thinking, man, where do you even start to dig through that to find any uh, personal um, memorabilia that you would want to hang on to, family photos or anything like that? And then to think that what is true for him is true across an entire nation and to recognize that what has happened in Ukraine is not unique in human history, but it is representative of so much of the history of humanity. And the second thought that came to my mind is just what a waste. What a terrible waste of life and resources and energy and hope. And the Bible says that our plea for justice, our desire for a different future than what we experience now, 
will be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ, who himself died for the sin of the world, who himself reigns supreme over all the nations of humanity, and who the Bible says is coming again. So don't prejudge the judge when we haven't even got to the courtroom yet. Don't uh, prejudge the story when we're only partway through the book. The one who rose from the dead is the one who is going to come in glory. And the one who died for the world is the one who will bring justice to the world. His verdict is true. Every sin will be accounted for. Uh, no act of righteousness will go unrewarded. He is the one for whom everyone from the least to the greatest, from the poorest to the mightiest, is going to answer one day. So, <clears throat> praise. Um, have you given attention to the character of God and the work of God? So then in your private prayer life, your private interaction with Him, and your public worship, uh, praise for you is not a response to a worship theme. Uh, praise for you is not just a response to music on the radio, but praise for you as a response to the character and person of God. Uh, can I give a couple, I hope, practical pastoral helps? Because lots of people struggle with worship and lots of people struggle with their own prayer life. And let me just offer a couple suggestions. Number one, um, a comparison of one worship service to another church or of your prayer life to what you think somebody else is, is like is virtually never helpful. If you're comparing yourself and evaluating your experience to others, um, your mind is not on the Lord. <clears throat> uh, last week I heard a news story. Uh, it was a sports psychologist who talked about the research of sports choking. When, when people are performing a kick or up to bat or a golf outing, and when they choke under pressure, they come up to do something that they've done hundreds, maybe thousands of times that they're extremely proficient at. And in the pressure of the moment, they cave and completely fall apart. Why does that happen? Um, the sports psychologist said it's not because people don't care. It's because they're caring in such a way that they start seeing themselves analytically instead of doing automatically what they've already ingrained in their system. And so <clears throat> they make a tremendous mistake that should have been an automatic response. <clears throat> and I thought about that in terms of worship. It is so easy to choke in our worship or in our prayer life if we are comparing ourselves to others, if we're analyzing everything instead of engaging the Lord. If I'm analyzing, why didn't that person smile at me? Why is the worship leader wearing that? Why is this song going on so long? It's just like for me, when I'm trying to preach here online, I've got this big light in front of me and I've got a camera and I've got a watch. And the more I focus on all those things, the less I'm able to do what I've actually tried to prepare to do. And folks, your worship life, your prayer life, your engagements with God, if you're constantly checking your pulse, Am I in the right mood? Should I be feeling something? Um, man, if, if you're always analyzing and critiquing yourself and the worship congregation where you're at, you will have a hard time worshiping the Lord because your attention is elsewhere. And so may I encourage you to approach worship and prayer with a major dose of humility. Um, if you were, if I was humble, I wouldn't be so worried. Am I saying the right thing? How am I coming across? What do I look like? What am I feeling? If I was truly humble, I would just kind of do it. C.S. Lewis, who is one of my favorite Christian authors of all time, said this. He said, often our praise and worship will feel like a 99% failure. <laughs> wow, really? <coughs> but he said this. <clears throat> If you perfectly loved God, your worship would be perfect, but you don't perfectly love God yet. You are perfectly loved. God cares about you. God is still great, but you're still here, a fallen person in a fallen world who's practicing worship, 
who's learning how to pray, who's learning to be thankful, who's learning to confess your sin, who's learning about God and learning to respond to him. But folks, um, this is not the final performance. Uh, you've got to get the glory for that. This is practice. This is training grounds. And if you will cut yourself and other people a little slack in terms of humility, you might find that your worship and prayer uh, flows much more freely in response to the goodness of a God who is not offended by struggling in prayer or struggling in worship or struggling with sin because he knows who you are and he loves you and he knows who he is. And the reason that he worships you is not because he needs it, but because he knows we need it. Hence the invitation to come celebrate. Let's pray. Or uh, rather, we're going to pause things for a moment. We're going to do communion. Uh, if you need to get some bread and juice, go ahead and do that. And we'll be back in just a moment to share the Lord's Supper as we close today's service.